Hello, welcome back. This is the second lecture. Now we're on the early days of the Roman Empire. This is lecture 12 out of a total of, I think, 29 or 30 lectures for this uh, semester. Second lecture in our third unit, though. The empire itself really takes off after the um, assassination of Julius Caesar. Caesar, of course, had served in various capacities as counsel and pro-counsel. He eventually uh, became named dictator, uh, which was a every six month rotating uh, job title for him for a time. It then was extended to a 10 year period and then he was named dictator for life. Eventually the senators uh, banded together and assassinated him, afraid that he was going to seize control um, in perpetuity, and eventually that is what happened for his successor, for Octavian. Um, by the time that Octavian finally defeats Cleopatra, who had been allied at one point with Caesar, um, who definitely helped to solidify his power, uh, eventually when Octavian defeats uh, Cleopatra and Mark Antony, he is now absolute ruler of Rome and begins to expand Roman territory even Further, it ushers in a period we refer to as the Pax Romana or the Roman Peace, an era of stability for Rome itself. But of course, I would call it peaceful if you were the people being attacked and absorbed into Rome and enslaved. Um, certainly for them, it was not a peaceful period, but it is sort of the high point of uh, Roman culture in many ways. We're going to see some of the most iconic examples of architecture and from Rome during this period. Uh, we'll look primarily at two dynasties today, the uh, Julio-Claudian dynasty, uh, which includes, but ends with the infamous Emperor Nero. Uh, and then he is succeeded by a relatively short period known as the Flavian dynasty that sees the construction of some of the major monuments that you're aware of, including the Colosseum um, under the Emperor Vespasian completed under his uh, son and heir, Emperor Titus. So one of the things that we associate, I think, with Rome is the idea of this military might and power combined with the issue of a ruler who works alongside a senate. It's somewhat similar to our structure in a way, I suppose. We do have um, a leader in terms of the office of the presidency balanced in theory by the houses of the senate and by our uh, judicial branch. In Rome, it doesn't quite work that way. The uh, senators continue to be of importance and to help with policy decisions and to voice concerns, but the emperor does have, to an extent, um, unlimited power, partially because they begin to deify themselves. It's not unusual for an emperor after his death to be named a god, and in the case of the emperor you're looking at, here, this is the very first emperor, Augustus. He even ties his own ancestry to a son of the goddess Venus, and that's represented for us here by the inclusion of Cupid kind of hanging on his coattails there. The Cupid reference also is to remind us that Venus has a romantic consort, the god of war, Mars or Ares, and so uh, Augustus is presenting himself both as tied to a lineage directed directly from the gods, but also a combination of kind of love and war. We see an enormous number of references to militaries on the uh, breastplate that he wears. He has his hand up in a gesture of oration as if he is a senator uh, himself dictating eloquently to the masses. But what you notice that's kind of odd about him is that if you cover the face, the body feels very much like the classical proportions that we saw in ancient Greece. And we saw that that body was kind of idealized. It wasn't a specific depiction of an individual. The face in this case, although it is prettified a little bit, he's made to look more glamorous, more handsome than he probably was in reality, still feels more like a specific individual than the faces that we were accustomed to seeing in ancient Greece. Note that the ears kind of stick out a little bit. There's some specific 
make sure that you recognize who this is meant to be. This piece is called the Augustus of Prima Porta because it was located in the city of Prima Porta. It was actually from near the uh, villa of his wife, Livia. So it's not to be considered like a private portrait of her husband as much as it is a more public sculpture to disseminate the image of the emperor and thereby his authority throughout the empire. So you can think of the body as being more or less idealized, the head somewhat glamorized, but still in that Roman veristic tradition to an extent. His haircut though is really meant to kind of connect him back to the classical era, the height of Greek uh, sculpture, which would then also connect him to the idea of the philosophy and ideals of that classical world. So he's very much using this art form kind of as a form of propaganda to show us who he is, why he has the right to rule, what connects him to um, both the history of Rome, but also to the gods themselves. He kind of takes on an orator, a general and a god all simultaneously with this perfect body and a more uh, individualized head. So it kind of combines multiple things that we've seen going on in artwork of other cultures. We've seen other cultures use art as a way of pr um, promoting a political agenda combined with a religious agenda. We've seen that pretty consistently all the way back to Mesopotamia. And here we see that in the service of this new empire. Definitely we see some realism in the portrait of Livia. This is Augustus's wife. Um, it was her villa that we saw the beautiful painting um, in that second style, uh, the beautiful garden with all the birds and trees. And you can see here that she is beautiful, but not absolutely um, mask-like and perfect in the way that the faces of those Greek goddesses tended to be when we were thinking about the art of classical and even Hellenistic uh, Greece. A very important structure for us to be aware of is this temple that was uh, designed, the altar of peace, Arapakas, which was to really commemorate the victory of Octavian, and his establishment of his right to rule. It is covered with elaborate, beautiful decoration in essentially relief all the way around the um, exterior. But above this decorative panel of relief, we also see scenes that depict some mythological characters as well as specific individuals within Augustus's own um, sphere of influence. We see him as well as some of his major ministers throughout the sculpture. We know that it would, like most ancient sculpture, have been painted. So this is kind of an artistic reproduction or replication of what we imagine the overall effect would have been. Keep in mind that you're not just seeing flat areas that are painted, you're seeing three-dimensionally sculpted to look lifelike. So you really get a sense of the kind of grandeur of what the Arapacus would have looked like. We see most likely the uh, founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, on the left-hand portion as you face the entrance. Aeneas, more than likely um, the ancestor that uh, Octavian claims his descent from, which connects him again to the gods, also thought of as a founder of Rome as uh, on those two panels on the front. There are processional panels on the side walls, the north and south side, and we also see the goddess both of Rome itself and of peace or Pax, that representation of this new um, kind of permanent state of everything being fine for the Romans thanks to the emperor Octavian. Or Augustus. So there's our front wall, the Romulus Remus panel here, the Aeneas panel here. You can see that there has been an attempt to replicate what should be there as well as to preserve the elements that are still um, in existence. So you see kind of in incised darkened lines, you can kind of see what the sculpture should have looked like. The procession along the south wall, which is really remarkable when you get close to it. One of the things I find most beautiful about this is that the adults are behaving not only 
specific individuals, but look at how much there's a sense of layers of three-dimensional space. The largest main figures do seem to produce our world in their very high relief, almost fully three-dimensional. Then behind them is a slightly lower level of relief down to a very low relief in this third tier behind them as if the figures are stacked in three-dimensional believable space. But also look at the variety in poses. We have three-quarter poses, we have profile poses, and then look at the children. The children are acting and reacting. Notice how they are interacting with the adults around them in ways that look like the way children actually behave. They're not focused on honoring the emperor. They're behaving the way kids do in public situations. You can see them tugging on their parents' garments, the older ones trying to act more adult, the younger ones need to act more childlike. It feels very much as if we're observing um, the real world, as if we're really seeing how people um, in reality behave. We can also specifically name some of the figures, including here Livia, the uh, wife of the emperor. This is the North Wall, North Procession, the panel that shows the uh, goddess of Rome herself, and the panel that probably depicts an idea of peace uh, either at goddess of the earth or the idea of peace as a goddess herself. We definitely, as we move through the era, establish comes to a kind of crashing end under Emperor Nero, who's known for his excesses and known for um, really bankrupting the state, particularly by completely renovating and building enormous palaces for himself that included this enormous man-sculpted lake, um, which will eventually be completely paved over. But his complex of buildings in recreation, here's his lake, includes this entire area as well as this massive colossal statue of himself, theoretically as the god of the sun. So you can imagine that Nero was really spending more of the money of empire on glorifying himself than on anything else. Nero, of course, was emperor during a famous period in which Rome suffered a major fire around the year 64, and he, um, at least in legend, um, fiddled while Rome burned. He care could care less about the people as long as everything was good for him. So he eventually uh, falls very heavily out of favor, and he is replaced, um, partially because of his lavish spending on his own palace, which became known as the Golden Palace. We definitely see, as we move into the next era, Flavian dynasty, we see this increased use of, or attention rather, on public sculpture and public architecture, more so than just things to glorify an individual emperor. Um, the Flavians were really concerned with spectacle and with um, maintaining the state, finances, but also providing an outlet for the citizenry. So we see the construction of the Colosseum and expansion of aqueducts. The Romans were really adept at using simple geometry and gravity to transport water across great distances. And that became really important the construction of the Colosseum in the draining of Nero's lake filling it in and building the uh, Colosseum directly on top of that site. So one thing to be aware of is why the Romans are considered so innovative when we consider the architectural systems that were available to us in earlier cultures. We definitely looked a lot at post and lentil construction, um, especially in ancient Greece, but in other cultures as well. And then a limit to how high you can build with this system and a limit to how much weight can be carried by this system. If you look, though, at two posts supporting a horizontal element, if that horizontal element were replaced with a perfect half circle, we actually can achieve higher height 
within the same distance between two vertical posts. By making that semicircle even taller, we can expand the distance in between the two posts, which is a much more efficient way of building a bridge. If we can build both and wider apart in between our posts, then we don't need as many supports as you see here in this river for this aqueduct to span that. So the aqueduct becomes a really massively important part of Roman architecture, made possible by the round uh, arch, plus a very careful mathematical system that gives us about a two and a half percent slope for to the lower end across any distance of the aqueduct, which would allow water to continually flow. It also allows us to use these as bridges. They become functional spaces for building roads throughout the empire, which facilitates trade and uh, movement of troops as well. So it's a really good example of engineering. It's a good example of evolving architectural ideas over time to provide uh, new solutions for solving structural and practical problems. It also shows us our first really good example of the use of cement. The Romans had multiple different recipes for types of stonework and types of of cement, but essentially a mixture of ash, lime, and an aggregate, some kind of broken stone, that as a liquid could be poured into a wooden mold. It would then take on the shape of that negative space of the mold. The wood could be removed, and then we could face the exterior with more elaborate, more beautiful material. You could use brick, or in uh, many cases, public buildings, you could use marble. It would cost less. You would be using less equivalent amount of stone than you would if you were building in the post and lentil Greek tradition. And it allows for um, much faster construction using a little bit less skilled labor. You would have fewer artisans necessary for dressing stone and for doing decorative work if you could have general laborers building molds and pouring concrete. So again, a pretty um, evolution of architectural and engineering technology. Again, the aqueduct eff effectively is a bridge and water conduit. This greatly exaggerates the um, overall slope of that angle. It is much uh, closer to a, about two and a half point degree slope, but the idea is still for the water to flow from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. We definitely see the Romans using these um, arch forms as well for uh, a variety of other forms. Not only will it become part of an aqueduct, but often the arch is used as a commemorative sculptural object or monument in its own right. And so we sometimes have uh, the form known as the triumphal arch, often to um, commemorate a particular military victory. Probably the most significant or well, most well known of the uh, construction projects during the Flavian era, begun by uh, Vespasian, completed under his son's reign, uh, Emperor Titus. Vespasian had really made his fame, made his career in putting down rebellion in Judea. Um, and in fact, even encircling the city of Jerusalem um, with a wall. The uh, heir, Titus, also is going to be responsible for essentially the sacking of Jerusalem and the raiding of the temple and returning to the capital city of Rome many of the incredible golden treasures from within that temple in Jerusalem. The um, act of putting down this rebellion and also helped to pay for the construction of something so large because, of course, the previous generation, Nero, had bankrupted the economy. So this object served multiple purposes. It was to obliterate traces of Nero. Remember, his original um, palace and lake are being destroyed. The lake drained, filled in, and this built on top. The statue of Nero is repurposed, not as a statue of him, but now fully re uh, rendered as a statue of the god of the sun. And that's, in fact, how this object gets its nickname, Colosseum, associated 
with this colossal statue, but its true name or its original name is the Flavian Amphitheater. Uh, amphitheater, again, being two theaters put together to create this circular or oval form. Uh, the Flavia part of the name, of course, comes from the name of the family line of the emperors who oversaw its construction. This is also a combination of multiple materials. A lot of it, of course, is cast concrete, but the majority of the outside circular ring, especially on that first base level, is limestone. Those series of there's 80 arches all the way around the outside on the lower level have what looked to us like a Doric style column, but technically you could call that Tuscan style because they do have bases and the capitals are slightly different. The second level, which is primarily faced with brick and then marble, is uh, Ionic order and the level above that Corinthian. So the materials are lighter on the and third and the fourth level, um, which doesn't have arches but would have had decorative medallions. Those levels above the uh, stone level at the outside would have run all the way around the Colosseum. So you would have had 80 uh, arches on the bottom level matched by 80 above that and 80 above that for a total of 240 arched openings. There would have been statues in the arches on the second and third level and decorative probably bronze medallions on the top level. The top level would also have supported a fabric canvas awning that was extended over the seating area to provide some shade and to help cut the heat. The structure of the Colosseum, though, as you look at the interior, really is a concentric series of rings. There's actually essentially six rings from that outside that we're looking at at the top left to the innermost entrances to the arena floor. The space below the floor, which is now exposed, developed slightly as project went on, but it essentially is a catacomb of rooms for preparing the gladiators and the other um, sacrificial victims, including animals. Uh, there was a system run by pulleys that would have allowed um, simple elevators to raise animals to the second level below the sand, where they could then be driven up ramps to trapdoors that would allow them to spring out onto the arena floor itself. We know that the Romans developed a really elaborate system of drainage to get the water off of the uh, from the original lake to begin with, but also to keep the um, work site from flooding and to keep the arena itself from flooding. The seating area is very much controlled based on class. The upper class would actually sit. Um, very close to the arena floor, and they had separate entrances that would allow them. The cheaper seats are, as in most arenas today, are the higher seats further away from the main action. So they originally were just meant to be stone and concrete um, seating on three major levels. The last level of wooden seating was an addition that allowed even more people into the space. So the estimate ranges between like 50,000 to 80,000 people. It is at its absolute height, peak attendance, that the entire arena could be emptied of spectators in 30 minutes or less. Um, major gates or entrance spaces that are numbered, uh, and tickets, of course, would be issued. And based on your ticket, you would specific arch that would direct you to a specific area to, to be seated. So this entire project took at least before it could be used functionally and even when it was opened it wasn't completely finished there's some debate over whether or not legend that one of the first games that was held was a mock naval battle which involved flooding the floor of the arena and floating small because of warships within it but we do know that they were able to drain and transport water so there is debate still about whether that's a legend fact. But of course we know that increasingly elaborate um, gladiatorial games were held here as well as other public
events. And that was certainly an aspect of keeping the population entertained and giving them something to do. If you have a culture that is built largely on the work of slaves and the amassing of wealth, then your middle and upper classes are going to have a lot more free time that could lead them to try to for themselves if they have distractions and entertainments it's more likely that they would um, be lulled in and less likely to rise up against the emperor. We're also seeing an emphasis here of the Flavian dynasty trying to really set itself apart from of Nero and to really return the focus to um, civic public life of Rome itself. We've talked about the use of cement. Omus cementicium is the Roman term for the cement. You can see that really clearly here, faced in with brick. We've talked about the engaged columns already, but remember that the columns on the Colosseum also are engaged as opposed to structural. You see that use of engaged columns throughout the temple designs in the Roman Empire. This particular uh, example is a Roman temple in today, modern day France. So we know that as the empire expanded, the uh, architecture itself spread throughout Western Europe. So we know that because of the existence of these objects, that this would be an influence on later generations. And clearly it is an influence on the architecture in our own capital in Washington, DC. For example, we know that Thomas Jefferson, who at one time was an ambassador to France prior to based a lot of his architectural designs on what he saw in Europe that were the remains of Roman ruins. And so here you see the Virginia State Capitol, which is actually very much built on a Roman model, which may seem odd to us in a way that our um, civic buildings, our governmental buildings look like ancient religious buildings, but it does give them the feeling that those buildings have a connection to an ancient past um, and makes them feel more legitimate. Here is Vespasian himself. He is the emperor who began the public works on the Colosseum. And a woman either from the Flavian era or slightly later imitating the style that was popular during the Flavian era. Either way, she's known as the Flavian woman. And she sports one of the most remarkable hairstyles that you can possibly imagine that was quite popular during the height of the Flavian empire. So she not only has her hair pulled forward and elaborately dressed into a cascading style, of elaborate curls, but her hair in the back, which is obviously quite long, has been braided and then twined into this very complex knot. So she is, I'm sure in some respects to us, appears to be kind of over the top in her fashion, but at the time she would have been on the cutting edge of um, the fashion of the Roman Empire. From a structural point of view, from a technical point of view, you can see that the themselves are cut really, really deeply. This is not hair that's just sort of a few incised lines to indicate hair on the top of an otherwise smooth surface. These are really fully three-dimensionally sculptural, which also indicates the use, increased use of drills as carving tools. Obviously, they would not have had electric drills. Um, the drills could have been turned by hand, which would have been quite laborious, more than likely they were uh, driven by a bow that would have been a string or thread that went around the pole of a boring element that had a tip that would do the actual drilling and as the bow was moved back and forth it would rotate that pole. You can definitely see that the influence of the attention to hairdressing continues throughout the Flavian era, whether you're young or old. During the Flavian Empire, it is, or the Flavian dynasty rather, it is a little more likely that you would see slightly more idealized features on faces, but we do still see veristic portraiture as in the example there to the right. It's kind of remarkable to think that in our culture, we tend to revere youth and beauty and facial symmetry we have a very fixed idea of what is beautiful, but in the Roman Empire, in many cases, what is venerated tends to be age and experience. 
We talked about the form of the triumphal arch. This is Titus, the uh, son of Vespasian. He is responsible for the sacking of uh, Jerusalem and returning the treasures from the temple to the capital city of Rome, where they were actually put on public display. The sculptural friezes, relatively high relief friezes that you see here, are on the inside of this freestanding arch. So it's not a temple, it's not an architectural building to be inside of, it is a physical monument that you would walk through, that you would have a procession through the space and you'd be able to see and view the sculptures from within. So the idea of this triumphal arch is really pretty important for the development of um, public sculptural forms. We're going to see many of these in ancient Rome. It is a form that continued even into the modern era. It is not unusual for later emperors to go back and reference these types of um, elements in their own triumphal arches, sometimes as in the case at the top. That particular example is Constantine's triumphal arch. You see that he has really expanded his ego. He has three entrances rather than just the single one that was sufficient for Titus. You can also see that he has stolen some elements of architecture from earlier emperors. So at this stage, though, the arch of Titus has only work that is original to him. We definitely see engaged columns being used, but more columns as decorative devices. It's not unusual to see sculpture in these pendentive areas here above the arch as well. That gives you a good sense of the monumentality, the, the large scale of these. It would make you feel humble, but maybe also proud were a citizen. You can clearly see that the columns themselves are not functional but decorative when you see places where the work has been damaged. On the interior you can really see the Roman style of these recessed areas known as coffers. Those will become even more important as we look at the design of domed structures. They're decorative certainly and they do create a feeling of a sky with stars which will be uh, See all throughout uh, Rome into the Middle Ages and even into the early Renaissance, especially in Italy. But it also allows there to be a reduction of weight in this um, ceiling because there's less stone there or less work there. That's probably the single most famous panel from the Arch of Titus. This is Return of the Spoils from the Temple in Jerusalem. The, again, Triumphal Arch, we see many examples here. Most often it's a single arch, as with the one we just saw of Titus, but later ones can include multiple openings. The area above the arch, these two triangular sections are known as spandrels. We often find uh, sculptural elements there as well. Some of the triumphal arches will actually begin to use a composite combination of the Ionic, note the volutes, and Corinthian, note the carved acanthus leaves. This composite capital becomes increasingly popular with the triumphal arch architecture.